Hello, STAT students. Last time we talked about the principles of good design and what a good, completely randomized experiment look like, um, design look like. And we also talked about observational studies and the vocabulary dealing with experiments. Today, we're going to continue talking about um, randomized comparative design, but there's two special types I'm going to mention. The first one is block design. So this is the experiment version of the stratified random sample. We break our subjects into two or more groups of a similar characteristic. That similar characteristic could be age, it could be gender, it can be height, can be weight. And that um, is called a block. We then randomly assign subjects from a block to a treatment. We do this for each block. So example, if we wanted to test um, a new drug to see if it makes people stronger, we can do a block by gender. And we are basically doing um, two experiments, so to speak. So we have the men receiving a treatment, and then you're going to compare their results with a control group. And then you have a women that are being treat, treated with a certain, with a drug, tested with that drug, and then you're going to compare with the control, and then you're going to get the results and compare if there was a difference between the genders. So that's an example of a block design, and we'll do another sample exa example as well. So basically, we're doing an experiment on each block. Blocks act as another form of control. They, they control the effects of some lurking variables by bringing those variables into the experiment in the form of blocks. So blocking is good in that sense because we can control those variables that often can't be distinguishable from the other explanatory variables. This allows us to draw conclusions about each block. Here's a sample block design. Anne is an avid baker who would like to compare two different chocolate chip cookies recipes. And these are A and B. So she recruits 10 volunteer taste testers, not a hard task to do, to rate each type of cookie on a scale from one, which is very bad, to five, which is very good. She will make 10 of each type of cookie for a total of 20 cookies. Each cookie tray will hold will only hold 10 cookies, so she will use two trays and bake them at the same time in the same oven, one sheet on the lower rack and one sheet on the upper rack. So if you look the outline, look at the outline, there's the 20 locations in the oven, and so apparently, you know, so that's done okay. Um, the top rack will have 10 spots and the bottom rack will have the other 10 cookies. And then she randomly assigns cookies into um, types. So five. So on the top rack, you have five of type A cookie, five type B. And then the bottom rack, you have five type A, five type B. But here's the problem. It says randomly assigned cookies, but nothing has been explained. So the key thing to remember when you're designing an outline is you need to explain your random assignment. Um, and also, it doesn't take into consideration, um, did one person get cookies only from the top? We don't know any of this information. How did you assign cookies to the person? So that's those are other questions that are going to be asked. So So 
So the key thing here is explain because somebody is going to ask you questions and if you don't explain your method, you are not going to get full credit. Another example how we can go from um, a completely randomized design to a randomized block design is say that our West High School was offering an SAT prep class. Um, they're going to offer it in two different formats, either online or the classroom teacher. And the counselors want to know which method will yield the higher SAT scores, so they're going to let us set up an experiment. 50 students have signed up, so we have 20 juniors, 20 seniors, and 30 juniors. If I were to ask you to outline a completely randomized design to compare the true two treatments, you could do something like this. You can take the 50 students and you would say, I numbered them one through zero, one through five, zero, or zero, one to 50. And then I used a random number generator to put them into groups. You're going to put them into two groups. First group will have 25 students. Second group will have 25 students as well. The first group will be um, given treatment number one, which is the online format. And the second group would, can be given treatment two, which is the classroom format. And then you're going to compare the SAT scores. So that's a good example uh, of a completely randomized design. Now, if I asked you um, to do a block design because what grade students are in is going to affect their SAT scores because seniors generally score better on the SAT scores than juniors. So how could we um, adjust the experiment that I just mentioned so that there's an even split of ju seniors and juniors in each class. So what you could do is to do a randomized block design by grade level, you can take your original 50 students and you can, um, so you have 20 seniors, 30 juniors. You're going to randomly assign the seniors um, 0, 1 to 20 and the juniors 0, 1 to 30 in a separate group, of course. And then for the seniors, you can have two groups split up into two groups. You can have group 1A with 10 people that they've been randomly picked and group 2A, 10 people. So group 1A can get the online format and group 2A can get the classroom format. And you do the same thing with the juniors. You have 30 juniors. They're split into two groups. Um, group 1B can be the online treatment, 15 kids, and group 2B can be um, the classroom teacher, 15, and then you compare the SAT scores. So there's another example, and that's a good example of a sample block design by grade level. The other type of specialized um, design is called a matched pairs. This is a special case of block design. with two options. So the first option is that it pairs subjects together based on their similarities. One subject from the pair is randomly assigned a treatment and the other subject will receive the other treatment. So an example, and I can kind of put one out here to the side, you have person A and you have person B. Person A is 45 years old. Um, female, 120 pounds. Person B is 44 years old, 100 female, and 121 pounds. Okay, you want to um, see whether the type of cookie a person gets and what their, or just basically test their sugar levels. So you give person A a sugar-free cookie. and a person B, a sugar cookie. And you're going to then compare their blood glucose levels. So that is an example of a match pairs design. You're taking people as similar as possible and then pairing them together. One person gets that first treatment, one type of treatment. The second person gets another type of treatment. And you do the same thing with persons C and D and persons E and F. So you partner them up based on as many similarities as possible. Okay. The second option is the subject receives um, two treatments. So case in point, 
you have person A who gets um, a sugar cookie on say day one and they're randomly given these types of cookies on whatever day and then that same person maybe day two or day three will get a sugar-free cookie and then you keep going like the person B might be randomly assigned a sugar-free cookie first and then um, a sugar cookie next and so on so the that person is paired the same person is paired with himself so the treatment received first would be randomly assigned for each subject so you don't always take that person a and give them sugar cookie and the next person b give them a sugar cookie first you randomly assign the treatment to each person all right here is a sample match pairs design a standing pulse rate different from sitting pulse rates. A class of 16 students is going to test the theory. They are arranged in the classroom in alphabetical order. In alphabetical order, they assign a person a single digit number from a table of random digits. All subjects assigned an even number, so two through eight, right, will stand first. All subjects assigned an odd number will sit first. They will be in their assigned position for several minutes, letting their body get used to the position. They will count their pulse rate for one minute, record the value, then switch positions. Again, waiting for their body to get used to the position before taking their pulse. We will compare the difference between their positions. So we're going to take, so each of these um, data values is the standing pulse rate and then the sitting pulse rate. So remember, the standing pulse rate will be the students with the even numbers, and then um, while they're doing that, the sitting people are taking their pulse and then switching. Um, we are gonna do a difference. So we wanna compare the difference between the positions. So the second column is standing minus sitting. And so anything positive means the standing pulse rate was larger. So your five, your six, your four, and so on. Anything negative is where the sitting pulse rate was greater. And then here's the class dot pot, plot. Sorry. So we see that the highest is negative 11. Let's do 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, negative 2, negative 4, negative 6, negative 8, negative 10. There we go. Okay, so 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Okay, so we have a 5. We have a 6. These are the differences. So... We have a 4, negative 2, 10, negative 1, negative 3, 7, negative 9, 6, again, negative 5, negative 11, negative 5 again, negative 4, negative 5 again, negative 4, hold on. Okay, I just need one more, so negative 8. All right, so that's your class dot, dot plot. What I did ahead of time is I put um, the difference in list 1, and then I did a one variable statistic. You want to keep 
make sure that you keep doing certain things like that so you don't forget how to do it. And I then calculated the median, the mean, sorry, the mean x bar was negative 0 0.9375. And the standard deviation was 6.42. So the mean is around right here, close to it anyway. And the standard deviation was 6.42. So if I added 6.42 to x bar, um, you're within one standard deviation of the mean, it would be somewhere right here. And the other one would be right there. And within two standard deviations of the mean, we'd have all of our data. So something like that, right? So there really doesn't look like there's a high probability that there's a difference there. And the differences we're not going to compare until second semester, but just kind of this is the match pairs design with the same where you could see the pairing that's being done. Okay. And the last little bit is statistically significant, which is also something that we talk about in second semester. But that is, there was no um, difference in the previous example. Um, statistically significant means that when an observed effect is so large that it can rarely occur by chance, I just wanted to bring this up briefly. We will use probability, and remember the next two chapters will be on probability, to determine if our results are statistically significant. For example, if there is only a 1% chance of getting the results from the experiment that we got, we call the results statistically significant that we did not get these results by chance and that they are true results. And I wanted to mention, going back to our SAT scores, another way to do um, an outline is to, let's look at that and do a matched pairs design so you have another sample of that. So we know that um, a student's GPA is certainly going to affect their SAT scores. So let's just take a look at only the juniors. We want to be sure that the different GPAs are being evenly distributed into the two treatment groups. How can we be sure that the GPAs are evenly distributed? So what we could do to design a match pairs design is we can order all the students using their GPAs from least to greatest, and this is for the juniors only. You take the two students with the highest GPAs and pair them up. So that could be a matched pairs. You flip a coin to assign one to the online class and one to the classroom teacher. We repeat this process with the next two highest GPA students until all the 30 juniors have been assigned. So that's an example of a match pairs design. And that is it for our 4.2B notes. Have a great day, STAT students.